and the singing. I will thank you everyone for doing such a wonderful job this morning. And I don't want to keep hammering this, but I can't help but agree with what has been said about home groups, isn't it? That really is really the heart of, of fellowship, and midweek fellowship. And really, if you aren't really attending one, do try and, and be part of a home group. Just start getting involved in people's lives. Encourage one another and exhort one another. And that really, you'll see yourself grow. You'll see yourself being encouraged and be a blessing to others. So, with that, <coughs> I want to continue with what I've learned in the home group. <laughs> and, and it's this sort of, I wanted to, when we were going through Genesis, I just was so taken up again by a study we did that I said, no, I just need to study this a bit more. And the more I did it, I felt I should share it with you. And as we've been going through, or starting to go through the patriarchs, we know that the examples of men and women are recorded in the, in the Bible, and these can provide really valuable lessons to us. You know, from Abraham, we've, we can learn the value of faith in God. Later on, we'll study Joseph, and we see the workings of God's providence and his providential care. On Job, we learn the importance of patience and faith in trying conditions. But today, we'd like to, I'd like to focus on Lot and the valuable lessons we can learn from Lot. And especially in the areas of decision making and making proper choices. So to do that, I just wanted to take you briefly through how Lot is introduced in the Word of God and what he does say from there onwards. And I've, the initial bits, I just want to remember, not coming up with any clever words, but just this, it's like he came, he saw, he settled. And that's the first bit of it when I want to introduce him and then we look at the consequences of what happened. So, if you turn your Bibles to Genesis 11 and before we go there, I would definitely would encourage us to then quieten ourselves and pray before we read the Word of God. So we'll be reading from Genesis 11. But let's just bow our heads and pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this beautiful morning. Thank you, O Lord, that your name is above all names. And Father, you have given us your wonderful word too, as a benchmark, as a guide, a lamp to our feet. As we look into it, Lord, Father, we do pray that you'd open our eyes and hearts and minds to listen to what you have to say. Thank you once again, Lord. In your precious name we pray. So towards the end of chapter 11, that's when we first learn of Lot, where he's described as the grandson of a man named Terah. Now Terah, as you know, is the father of Abraham, and Terah had three sons, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Lot is born to Haran, and in the same passage we learn, learn that Haran died. He must be pretty young, because... In those days, people did tend to live long, but Heron seemed to have, uh, have demise quite early. And then, from that passage, we know that Lot came into the care of his uncle, Abram. And one of his first journeys recorded in the Bible is when Terah, in verse, at the end of chapter 11, says, Terah took Abram, Sarai, and Lot from where they lived, that's the Ur of the Chaldeans, to go to Canaan. Only that uh, they didn't quite make that far. And uh, they stayed in another place called Haran. And uh, that's where we get the, great, the famous call of God from chapter 12 in Genesis, Genesis to Abraham. Where we read how Abraham is commanded by God to leave 
your country, your people, your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. And when Abram gets up to leave, we find, what do we find in verse 4, chapter 12? So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And so it's quite clear that Lot has now under Abram's care. That's quite common in those days to have that. Once his father's passed away, the next senior person looked care, took care of that person. And then since Terah had died, Abram looks after him later on. So, so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And if you see the first verse of chapter 13, it continues in the same fashion. Then Abraham went up from Egypt and he and his wife and all he had and Lot with him to the south. So Lot, it seems, from that, is like under the care of his uncle, Abraham, and he probably has a great relationship with his uncle. And, and, and they really seem to be having, having a great time. So he came with Abraham, he saw. See, the next bit is, in chapter 13, is when we pick up Lot again. And in chapter 13, then a few more details start gathering there. And in the life of Lot, up to that point, they seem to be inseparable from whatever we get there. But then we find that the strife begins to arise between the servants of Lot and Abram. And that strife was over the fact that each herdsman sought water and the best pasture for the animals of their master. But there was conflict and competition inevitably, inevitably led to that. So in, the, in verse 6 we see in, in, uh, that now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. So, there they were, uncle and nephew, and all prospering as we can see. They've, there's so much of, of stuff they get, and cattle and everything, that now it becomes difficult, the water and, and sharing the land. Now what we take, the story takes from this, Abraham notices the strife and calls Lot to him and orders to resolve that issue. Good point, isn't it? So if you pick the story in verse 8, it says, Finally Abraham said to Lot, Let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice, any section of the land you want, and we will separate. If you want the land to the left, I'll take the one to the right. If you want the land on the right, I'll take the land to the left. And verse 10 says, Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, or the beautiful land of Egypt. In brackets it says, this was before Lot destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flock and servants and parted company with Uncle Abraham. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Then we go on from there as to how Abram, God said to him, look as far in every direction and gives Abraham his promise. But we want to stick with Lot. If you see there, he looks at that land and he sees the beautiful greenery and gets attracted to a place of Sodom and pitches his tent. He's still moving tents close to the city of Sodom. He came, he saw. And then that's where we, we leave we lot, lot, we don't hear much of Lot after that till the next chapter. And the next thing we hear in chapter 14 is this, he gets caught up in some sort of a conflict there and in, a, in between a war and Lot finds himself caught in the middle of this and some kings begin warring in that area where Lot is and people are living and the Bible records that they're carried off with all their possessions as captives of war and Lot was one of them. Abraham hears of this and then rescues Lot, freeing him and all their possessions. But 
again the Bible, we don't hear much about Lot till we come to chapter 18 and 19. But we know from chapter 19, was where, was, where did Lot go after that? He went back to Sodom. Even after being rescued, he had that chance to get back and be with Abraham. But he decided, no, he had come, he had seen, and he settled in Sodom. In chapter 18, we know that God and two angels went to visit Abraham. And there, Abraham pleads with, with, with God when he hears that he's going to destroy Sodom. And pleads and, and, and says, oh, can he save 50 people? 45, 35, well, he comes down to 20, 10. And he pleads that God would save Sodom if, if ten people are found righteous in that city. And that's where we finish in 18. But 19, and I want you to move with me into chapter 19. And read from verse 1. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose and met them, and bowed himself and his face to the ground. I just want you to notice that progression. He just came with Abraham. He saw them and chose to go to that beautiful land. was attracted to Sodom for some reason. In spite of getting captive and, uh, uh, captured, he still returned to Sodom. And not only was his as you said, the last we hear is his tents were pitched outside the city. Now he is not just part of the city, but he is obviously a leader in the city. Because he is sitting at the gate. He settled. And that's, I just wanted to build up that story to bring you to this. To what I wanted you to, to hear and what I've learned about Lot. And when the first word that comes to my mind when I hear of Lot is the word compromise. And I'm not using the word compromise in the positive sense, but in the negative sense. Lot is a man that placed many things in jeopardy in his life. You say, why are we telling us about Lot? Yeah, he must be a... Uh, he's un, he was a not righteous man and that's, what, that's, what, that's why he did all these things. But no, the reason we are learning about this is because the Bible calls him righteous. If you turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 7, 2 Peter chapter 7, at chapter 2, there's no 7 in Second Peter, obviously. Verse 7 in chapter 2. I would be teaching heretics if I was teaching from chapter 7. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 7. If you pick it up from 4, 4. If God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those afterwards who would live ungodly. And what? Verse 7. Delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man, for that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. So folks, we know the story in chapter 19. And we'll go to that in, in a few moments. But the Bible still records Lot as a righteous man. Who was tormented or vexed, as some of your versions might say, by the sin that was around him. So put yourself in Lot's place. Put yourself in where you are today. Where are you in the world? Have you seen something? Are you settled in a comfortable place? 
Are you sort of getting comfortable with the world? Let's look at Lot and see what happened to him and how it affected his decision-making process. I think you agree with me when you read that Lot did compromise, didn't he? Here he was with, with Abraham. Everything is fine, settled. He had, the, he had seen God's blessing being poured out on Abraham. His promise, yet he chose to cut his own path. So there was a compromise. And what led to that compromise? What led Lot to compromise? It will also help you to understand maybe why do we compromise in some areas. And that's the lesson I want you to learn from here. The answer to that is very simple. It's the scene in his choice or decision at the, at the first resolution or strife between him and Abraham. As Lot gazed over the lush, fertile plains of Jordan, he saw the incredible opportunity to improve his place. Lot is a perfect example of human tendency to look out, take care of oneself first. To do what you think is best for yourself and not take care of about other people. The idiom is look out for number one. That's what he was. That's the first reason I think he caused him to compromise. Do we tend to do that? It manifested itself in many ways. He was blinded by the dangers of Sodom. The Bible records there, right in chapter 12 or 13, that it was a wicked place. Lot went with what appealed most to his appetite. He was probably blind to the dangers of Sodom. Do you think he didn't know about it? They lived in that area long enough. He and Abraham were in that area for long. They probably knew about Sodom. They knew about the sins of Sodom. It would be naive to think that Lot was not aware of this, the depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yet in spite of this knowledge, Lot still chose the way he did. In fact, as we have said, he pitched his tent outside the city. Then he goes into the city and then he's the leader of the city. Lot compromised everything in his life because of his choice. It also caused him to trust in his own ways. And we see that if you, take the, if you turn with me again to chapter 19, we'll see how he behaved. But before that, you could see in one more place when he was caught in that whole war. He decided to trust in his own ways and returned. But as I said in chapter 19, the whole influence of Sodom has so, influ- so infected Lot's mind that, it, that the story just gets from bad to worse. So he's sitting there at the gate of Sodom. He rose to meet them when he, he recognized them. He bowed to himself and his face toward the ground. And he says, Here, my lords, please. Turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet that you may rise early and go your way. And they said, no, we'll spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. And he said, no, no, turn to him and enter his house. He says, I'll make a feast. And he, he bakes and unleavened bread. And they ate and he served them. He invited these, these people who he recognized as godly people. Probably knew they were angels. And brought them into his own home. And we know the story that before dawn, the men of Sodom wanted to uh, have pleasures with these men. And then Lot tries to compromise his whole situation. And what does he come up with? But verse 5, it says, they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring out. Bring them out so that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them and shut the doorway behind him and said, Please, my brethren, don't do so wickedly. I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please, let me bring them out to you. Then you can do them as you please to them. What father in the right mind would do such a thing? Yet, he was trusting his own ways rather than God's ways. The whole influence had so infected his mind that he thought offering his Daughters was a solution to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's exactly what happens to us as Christians when you get in, involved with the wrong people. When we 
run with sinners. Sin loses its severity. You don't. And so one sin seems to be, oh, that, okay, fine. This, oh, this is, or oh, they want to just, they want to, they want to be kindly involved with these men. Oh, offer my daughters. That's a lesser sin. No. They are equally bad. It's just that he was so tainted by the ways of the world that he had lost his bearings as to what's right and what's wrong. Lord didn't think about the wickedness of Sodom when he was looking at the plains of Jordan. He thought it was a great place. It looked good. That happened to Eve as well, didn't it? She saw the forbidden fruit. It looked good to her. The lifestyle had rubbed off to him. But he wasn't aware of this. Because he made a foolish decision one after another. He keeps making foolish decisions. If you go further, what happened? The men were out to get Lot. And the angels miraculously pulled him out, pulled him in and blinded the folks there. Who in spite of them being blinded kept searching for the door. Even when the angels miraculously delivered Lot from the crowd by making them blind and told Lot God's plan, they tell him the plan of destruction that God has for them. For the city of, uh, uh, for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. But when it was time to go, what happens? He hesitated. He hesitated. That's what had happened to him. He could have hesitated for many reasons. Maybe his sons-in-law were there. And he knew people. He probably had made good friends there. Whatever it was. But he hesitated. And went on route. Again, God has a plan to take the hills. And he said, no, I want to go to Zohar. Lot kept making this Mistake after mistake, and I don't want to go into that, but we have a reason for compromising Lot's life. It began with simply looking out for what was best for him. Now, that had caused a lot of compromise in his life. We saw for one that he had compromised the relationship with Abraham. He had compromised on his blessings of God. But mostly, he had compromised his family as well. Probably one of the saddest things that happened as a result of Lot's decision of placing his family, his family in jeopardy by moving to Sodom. The very safety of his family was compromised. That we see in the international conflict itself that there was there. His married daughter and sons-in-law refused to leave him, leave with him. When the warnings, when he went to warn them about the destruction of Sodom, they laughed at him. They had become accustomed to the wickedness of the city. Lot's wife looked back at Sodom after being warned not to and turned into a pillow of salt. His daughters committed incest with him. Having been exposed to the wickedness of the city of Sodom for most of their lives, they saw nothing wrong with what they did. They compromised his relationship with God, his relationship with Abraham, his relationship with his family, he compromised. And that's where I want you to see the decisions reached by Abraham, Lord, are the same as those that confront every Christian. Lot looked at what his eyes saw. Abraham listened to God. We must decide for ourselves whether you trust the sovereignty of God or your own schemes and devices. We must determine whether to trust the uncertainty of riches or the rich supplies of God. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, and not of the Father, but it's of the world. That's what 1 John 2 15 says. So 
So as we see, and I'm sure you've realized that yes, Lot compromised. And there were some consequences of his compromise. As we went first, the consequence of his compromise was what? He was reluctant to flee evil. And what are we told to do? Flee from evil. I famously taught my children this. 2T222. Sounds like a bird fleeing. 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy it's flee from evil. If you can't resist temptation, flee from it. That's what we are commanded to, commanded to do. But here was reluctance to flee evil. The angels literally had to lead Lot and his family. If you read chapter 9, 19, verse 15 and 16. When the morning dawned, and the angels urged Lot to hurry. Urged Lot to hurry. If someone told me that city is going to be destroyed by fire. Why would I be reluctant? Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, the hands of his two daughters. And the Lord, being merciful to him, brought him out and set him outside the city. They had to literally drag him out of there. That was the consequence of his compromise. He was reluctant to flee evil. We must keep the world out of us. So many of us are reluctant to distance ourselves from the activities and associations of evil. We are all guilty of that. I am guilty of that. We are reluctant to leave the things of the world. And we will suffer the consequences of that. The yearning for earthly things was stronger than the will to obey God. Look at his wife. Her glance back was fatal. Grim recall, Jesus says, simply says that, remember Lot's wife. We need to remember Lot's wife when we are tempted to allow worldliness to get hold of us. Turn with me to James 4.4. 4. James chapter 4, verse 4. Again, he's talking to believers. And he's talking, why is there strife among you? Why is there unhappiness among you? Why are you, 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 you ask, but you don't receive because you don't ask. Um, you, you, you spend everything on your pleasures. And verse 4, he says, adulterers and adulteresses. Strong words. Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You're clearly told to keep the world out of us. And the reluctance to do that it has a lot of consequences of the compromise. And you say, why are you calling them adulterers and adulteresses? But if you look at that, even if secular psychology will tell you the same thing. If someone commits adultery, it doesn't just happen suddenly. You've already been looking. You see. You formulate thoughts. You even have indulged mentally before you actually get into the physical realm of it. And that's, that's the truth. And that's what the word of God is telling us. When he calls believers adulterers and adulteresses, that's what we are are dabbling with the world. And that's what Lot did. But you know what? That's a great warning God has given us. Imagine. I love that about the word of God. He puts characters like that into the word of God to teach us. It's not just a story of good people who live great lives, did miraculous things. 
It's a, it's, it's a story of ordinary folks like you and me who struggle with their faith. But you know what? The Bible calls them righteous. And so we have to learn from him. He's not like, okay, it's not the lesson to learn is not that, yes, I'm saved, I can sin as much as I want to, God will count me righteous. You've got the wrong message. It is, do not compromise with the world. We must live in this world, but the world does not have to live in us. Quickly to wrap up, how should we guard ourselves from the influence of the world? Okay? Because that would be incomplete without that. We know that Lot lost his fight against materialism probably, and it cost him dearly. He probably did not even regard sin. He probably had a light regard for sin. And that's why he put himself in a, in a, in a bad place. Bible says he was vexed, but not enough to flee from there. So don't be deceived. Don't allow sin to ruin and control your life. Escape. John Piper talks about wasted life. Don't be like that. This is a typical example of a saved soul but a wasted life. And most of us are like that, isn't it? We get up, go to work, come home, eat, go to bed, get up the next morning, eat, go to work, come back. It's time next Sunday, let's go to church. Is that what describes us? Or do we have that vibrant life of, yes, I live this day for my Lord, wake up in the morning, spend time with Him, go work, be a beacon for Him, wherever you are. Spend time with fellow brothers. Encourage one another. And worship Him together. It's the choices we make that greatly affect our lives. The biggest choice you're ever going to make is to follow Christ, isn't it? And that will determine whether you're where you are in, in eternity. And I praise God that most of us, or hopefully all of us here, are saved. I, I can only see you from outside and God knows your heart. The other important thing that we have is choosing careers. The choice you can make is can have a lasting effect on your marriage, your family, your service to God. Choosing a life partner. Choosing your friends. Choosing where you live. These are all choices that we have that, that, that can Make or break our, our, our family, our life, our, our walk with God. How can we make the right cho- choice? You know, James 1, 5 to 8 says, Ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him. Ask in faith, with no doubting. And that's the first step. Seek advice from others. Seek godly advice. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Seek counsel. That's a practical thing we can do. But we think we know it all. We falter again and again, failing to seek counsel. Consult the wisdom found in the Bible. Whatever you do, do it for the Lord's sake. And the example of Lord should serve Lot to serve to teach us to make proper decisions is very important. It warns us not to make our choices 
or take them lightly. I get, when I think of Lot, I see how easily we can see, come down, settle, and get compromised. I'm going to close with the illustration that we everyone knows, but I want to say it again. It reminds me of a frog that jumped into a pond. It looks so attractive and beautiful, that frog. It started getting a bit warmer, and he says, wow, lovely. It's warm water. I know my body can't take it, but I'm enjoying it. It started getting warmer, and he says, still, I'm still enjoying it. It's still a beautiful, beautiful pond. It got hotter. He didn't even realize it because he was now accustomed to it. Till we all know the water boiled because he had jumped into a kettle of boiling water and died. A grim but great reminder for all of us is how we can be complacent in this world, be lulled by its innocence or lack of harm, and ruin our lives. But you know what? The beauty and the great hope we have is our God forgives. Our God has given us a hope. He's given us examples like this to follow and learn from. Remember a lot the next time you face with an important decision. Seek to make that decision based on the will of God and not your own. I hope it's a grim but a timely reminder. And we just hope and pray that we won't be like the frog, but we look in the Word of God and make wise decisions. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for your Word. Thank you for the fact that it is like a two-edged sword that cuts into our hearts and speaks to us. And we just do pray that each of us would apply this and look at our own lives and, and learn from the lessons we have learned from the life of love. Thank you once again, Lord. In your precious name we pray. Amen.